somehow I'm doing back-to-back videos on Bill Maher's show real time, which I didn't intend, so I hope you'll forgive a repetitive theme, but my fascination with that show isn't necessarily about the show itself. It's because the show is a microcosm for the current state of the American political landscape. You have one side, the left, becoming increasingly insular, losing political influence by the day, but insisting they have some sort of self-evident moral high ground. And because of that perception, they refuse to consider the ideas of the other side, even if it has the consequence of costing them political power. This dynamic has already been in play, but it couldn't be better illustrated than it is by the events that have developed this week. On Wednesday, Real Time announced that on Friday night's episode, Bill Maher will host Breitbart editor and popular speaker Milo Yiannopoulos, fresh off his latest round of campus speaking visits, which were met with often violent and destructive resistance you may hear reported as protest, the worst of which occurred at UC Berkeley, where there were several assaults and over $100,000 in damage to campus property. And all because a speaker speaking would be too damaging. Milo's booking on real time prompted one of Bill Maher's previously booked guests, journalist Jeremy Scahill, to cancel his appearance on the show, a move he describes in a statement he posted to social media saying he cannot participate in an event that will give a platform to such a person, a person he describes as hateful, racist, and even violent. The statement is full of completely bogus claims and reasoning, which I will analyze momentarily. But before that, I want to be completely clear with you about the format of Bill's show and specifically what Scahill is avoiding. Milo is booked to be Bill's one-on-one interview at the top of the show to discuss free speech on college campuses, a topic on which I suspect they may actually have significant agreements. Considering Bill has faced deplatforming efforts at schools for his remarks, including at Berkeley specifically. After that interview concludes, a panel discussion on current events will follow, a panel that would have included Larry Wilmore, Jack Kingston, and Jeremy Scahill, who will now have to be replaced with somebody else. Under this structure, at no point would Scahill engage Milo directly. And Scahill knows this. He knows the format of the show. He knows how it works. He has been a guest on the show a dozen times since 2007, including in that very one-on-one interview seat. Now, I know some of you real-timers will note it's possible that the two would share the stage after the show on the overtime segment, but that's a segment dedicated to audience questions. The one-on-one interviewee doesn't always join this segment, and it's only 10 minutes that doesn't even air on HBO. The point is, Scahill is not skirting a debate with Milo. He's skirting simply being on the same show, or being in the same building, or just being in the same general vicinity as Milo. Don't mistake that for a principled stance. It's playground politics, and Milo has cooties. But that's just where Scahill's absurdity begins. If we explore his reasoning, it only gets worse. In addition to the childish names and buzzword accusations Scahill throws at Milo, which I'm going to dismiss simply on the basis that he offers nothing to substantiate them. Specifically, if you're going to warn about impending deaths, it might help to cite a death. Scahill's logic is contradictory and self-defeating in several respects. Scahill says Milo has ample venues through which to spew his hateful diatribes. And with only a one-sentence intermission, Scahill then says real time will give Milo a large, important platform presumably amplifying his message. Well, which is it? If Milo has ample venues, plenty of venues, influential venues through which to express himself, how much amplification are you actually doing? Is it possible that if Milo has ample venues, and accordingly, ample influence, that it will actually be him who amplifies real time's reach. Maybe I'm mischaracterizing Scahill's position, so I'll try to be more charitable here. Even if Scahill simply means that Milo does not need additional ears for his message, who is Scahill to decide? I and many others say, let the man speak and let the ears decide if the message is compelling or not. And if the message is truly as awful as Scahill describes, Wouldn't this amplification bring it additional scrutiny anyhow? Scahill emphasizes his love and respect for everyone at real time, Bill included, noting he considers them like family. But, as Scahill says in the subsequent paragraph, Milo is a bridge too far, a villain 
too villainous. So what Scahill has established here are the competing interests of his love for the show and its people versus his distaste for Milo. And he has decided that his distaste for Milo is the more powerful force. Makes me wonder, if that's true, what kind of love and respect does he actually have for the show? Consider a comparable circumstance here. Let's say you have a loved one, your hypothetical sister, and your sister is under threat from someone you despise. Let's say this person has actually kidnapped her and is holding her hostage. It stands to reason you would do everything in your power to defend your sister. But Jeremy Scahill says, sorry sis, but I really, really, really hate that kidnapper, so I'll catch you later. Love you. I understand the facts are exaggerated in my hypothetical, but the reasoning still applies. You don't ditch the people you love and respect when they are in trouble. You defend them. Unless, of course, it's not a gesture that's about them at all, and you're really just broadcasting your own virtue. Ultimately, Scahill's own reasoning requires he accept a ridiculous conclusion. Scahill presents the premise that Milo has become popular. He has ample venues. People listen to his messages. Correctly so. He has a best-selling book on Amazon. He's one of the most in-demand speakers at college campuses. Scahill also presents the premise that Milo is not only ideologically dangerous, but physically dangerous. Milo may incite violence against immigrants, trans people, and other vulnerable communities, which may even lead to death. For both of these things to be true, you have to conclude that a large portion of the American population enjoys, appreciates, perhaps even participates in the targeted abuse of these quote-unquote vulnerable communities. You have to conclude that Milo's popularity is at best in spite of, and at worst, because of these awful things you describe. That seems like a fantasy conclusion to reach. Sure, there may be violent bigots out there, or at least people who enjoy violent bigotry, but hundreds of thousands of them, or millions of them, enough of them to prop up one of the most in-demand cultural figures? But I suppose for Scahill, it's easier to maintain a fantasy in his head than it is to confront the idea that he may be wrong. And maybe, just maybe, the reason that Milo has ascended as high as he has is because he offers reason. And maybe the reason that he offers is strongly persuasive. And I get it, there is a certain discomfort in challenging your own ideas, in considering the possibility that you may be wrong. I often don't like doing it either. It's a skill very few of us master and it takes uncommon integrity. Perhaps the rarity of that integrity is why The Intercept, the publication Scahill co-founded, prides itself on fearless, adversarial journalism. Unless, of course, the adversary is particularly scary, in which case Scahill will advocate for fear and for surrender. But the only person who loses in this circumstance is Scahill himself. The rest of us still get to hear Milo, we still get to hear Bill, perhaps their ideas will clash, and each of us will get a decision to make about who is right. Scahill's self-censorship stunt in the name of perceived moral superiority doesn't make anyone consider his case. It only perpetuates the reaction a lot of people already had to this story. A simple phrase I could have used to summarize this entire video. Jeremy who? Thanks, as always, for listening and for supporting this channel. Always appreciate that thoughtful discussion down below and especially over on Twitter. That is at ML Christensen. You're always welcome to come hang out and chat in my live streams. Those are linked down in the description. Looking forward to it. Okay, bye.